Okay, well, uh, here we are, everyone. Thanks so much for your uh, patience. Sorry for uh, the slight delay in uh, our presentation today. We had a little bit of technical uh, difficulties when your computer decides to, it needs to restart and then won't restart. Life gets really interesting. So our apologies for, uh, for that, but we have a great um, uh, presentation uh, for you today. Peter Marks, uh, Master of Wine and our Vice President of Education is here with us today. And he is going to be, um, well, why don't you tell us, Peter, what, what you're gonna be talking about uh, today. Well, thanks, Christian, and thanks everyone for being patient. Uh, I actually have three red wines in front of me today. And in about two weeks time, the Diploma D3 course, that's the Wines of the World unit, will be taking their final exam. Many of our listeners, I'm sure, are probably part of that group. Uh, so I'm going to do what would be part of that tasting exam, which is typically called the mixed bag. It comes at the very end of the tasting. So we, you have 12 wines in the blind tasting, and wines 10, 11, 12 are always the so-called mixed bag. And so I thought today we'll do a little tasting, definitely need a glass of wine after that computer glitch, and we'll do a um, using the systematic approach. Now, this will be sort of a diploma level, but you can be at any level. Uh, that you are interested in wine to be able to you know, get a little bit of uh, information and discussion about wine styles, wine typicity, and things like that. Uh, so Christian, if you wouldn't mind going to the very first slide, okay, and you can play blind tasting with us. So the, the outline that you have in front of you is to show you, um, and I can't see the PowerPoint, so maybe you could just, on that one slide, go not put in yeah. all the bullet points. So the, what I've decided to talk about is really um, how you would approach the systematic approach when you're dealing with these so-called mixed bag wines. And the first thing is to maybe think about whether it's a an old world or a new world. Uh, and you know, typically old world and new world nowadays can often easily be masked and you can't necessarily differentiate the two, but a different way or another way to look at it would possibly be think about cool climate versus a warm climate. For example, if you have a wine that's really high acidity, maybe it's got restrained fruit, maybe even a little stony minerality, you might get the idea that it's probably of a cool climate or possibly even an old world. On the other hand, if you have a wine that's over, overly abundant with pronounced fruit intensity, very ripe fruit, maybe jammy, um, maybe the acidity is medium, medium plus at best, you might presume that that wine comes from a warmer climate and more likely something that would be found in the new world. Um, and it's always important that you know your flavors and your aromas and the descriptors that are common with those different types of grape varieties. But the most important thing, I think where people maybe get misled is by following just the aromas and flavors too closely. Because a lot of times, different grape varieties can overlap in the type of profile that they will display. And so because of that, what is really more important is to understand the structure of the wine. And what I mean by that, obviously, is the acidity, the alcohol, you know, the body, sweetness, and tannin. Now, let's take, a, let's take a grape like Riesling. I think most of you probably know Riesling is a high acid grape. Um, it rarely ever has more than medium alcohol. It's either low or medium at best and tends to have, you know, sort of light to medium body. Very likely has some sweetness um, and no tannin, of course. Now, if you're thinking about a grape like uh, Grenache, you know, Grenache typically has high alcohol, only medium acid at, at best, maybe even lower than that. And the tannins tend to be pretty soft. So if you have an idea of the structure of these grape varieties, um, it'll go a long way and help you understand where these wines are coming from. Wine making can also play a factor. You know, certain places in the world have a tradition for uh, different types of wine making techniques. Again, if you're looking at a, um, let's say you have a, California Chardonnay, and you're getting lots of Lee's character, maybe some um, oak influence from barrel fermentation, uh, maybe a little buttery diacetyl character from malolactic. You know, that can kind of push you to, you know, Chardonnay uh, winemaking techniques. And then quality. Uh, you know, obviously, if you are, let's say you think you're in a fine climate, uh, fine uh, region that makes really high quality wines like Bordeaux, um, you know, that could be an idea that if you get a really intense Cabernet or Merlot-based wine with lots of rich oak, uh, incredible depth and complexity, great balance, uh, long finish, you know, that can lead you to a real well-known classic area. And again, speaking of classic wines, generally the wines that come in the final mixed bag are wines that are well-known. So 
it's important that you have a, a really good handle on the different types of grape varieties and the regions where they can be found. I think many of you have probably heard me say many times is that blind tasting exams are really a theory exam with a tasting. And in fact, these are the theory aspects that are really important for you to know in order to, in order to deduce what the wines could be. Again, if you know from your experience what these different characteristics based on structure, winemaking, quality, as well as characteristics of the grape, then you'll have a good handle on where the wine may be coming from. Okay, so ready to get started? Chris, if you wanna go ahead and hit the next slide. So I, I have three red wines and there are 12 options for, the, for each of the wines. And they're the same 12 options. So as I go through, I'm gonna show you my tasty note. And when I do that, you know, you can take a look at my notes and see if you have uh, a sense of what it might be. And if you find, for example, in the first wine that maybe you find it's a Barbera, and then obviously I'm not duplicating any wine. So wine two and three most likely is not a Barbera. So as we go through, you know, think about what wine it is uh, from my description. And after each wine, I'll, I'll give you the uh, identification to let you know what it is. So go ahead, Christian, we'll go to my first tasting note there. And I hope you can see that. It, maybe you want to make that larger so everybody can see it. Um, but this is actually my little tasty note that I put up here for the wine number one. And for the intensity, I found this wine to be pale. Um, the color of the wine um, is ruby. And the reason it's pale is that I can very easily see through it as I hold the glass up. And I put my fingers between my glass and my white background. I can tell that I just clip my fingernails yesterday. They don't need to be clipped. Sometimes if you can see your fingernails, uh, generally for me, that's a pale colored wine. If you're holding the glass up and again at a 45 degree angle, and if I have put my hand between the glass and the white background, if I can see my fingers, but if I can't really make out the length of my fingertips or fingernails, then that would be medium. And if I hold the glass up and can't see my fingers at all, that I would classify that as deep. When I smell this wine, it's not particularly intense. It's a little bit restrained. So I give that a medium intensity on the nose. And if you go to the right side of that systematic approach grid, you'll see some of my descriptors. I have the red floral notes like rose and violet. Predominantly, this is red fruit. So I'm getting a lot of raspberry, cherry, a little bit of an unripe red fruit, maybe some cranberry um, and also some red currant. There's a little bit of red fruit, but um, in the sense of black currant, which is a little bit of a wild you know, black fruit, some red cherry uh, and some black cherry as well as black plum, and even a little bit of red licorice. Now, I don't mean that the wine is sweet. Um, I'm not tasting that red licorice. I'm just smelling it. So you know, sometimes red licorice can have a little bit of a tart smell to it. And the fruit to me seems to be just right. So already I'm getting a sense that this is not from a particularly warm climate, given that there's a lot of kind of red fruit, the aroma intensity is only medium at best. And then there's a few other characteristics, which I think really point to more of a cooler climate or possibly old world. And that's a pomegranate, which is a tart red fruit and these dark stone characters, sort of an, an earthy character, not, not from bottle age, but just something that there's a sense of terroir in this one. So go ahead and I'll give this a little taste to reconfirm what I've already written down. Mm. That's, first of all, I think it's really good. Uh, it's dry, medium plus acid. Tannins are not that heavy. So sort of medium minus to medium. And I would classify them as fine grain, meaning they're really, really well integrated. Nothing sticks out in, in those tannins. They're not coarse in any way. Um, body's medium, again, intensity medium, as we found before. The finish, this is the second time I've had this wine today. And right now I'm actually leaning a little bit more towards medium plus. When I first tasted it earlier today, it was more in the medium range, but I think the wine's opened up as it's been uh, uncorked and sitting in the bottle. Now, using the Blick formula, um, this wine would be classified as good based on its really fine balance and really good complexity. It's got multi different characteristics and clusters that are describing the aromas and flavors. But that doesn't really, to me, signal exactly what this wine tastes like. And so I've gone to those other cr uh, criteria that you can use besides balance, length, intensity, and complexity. Besides Blick, you can also talk about the typicity of the wine 
or the uniqueness? Does this have a sense of place? And I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but it certainly has a real true sense of place. And it also has some uh, suitability for bottle age, as I've mentioned in the final bottle aging note. This wine can age. I think the medium plus acidity, which is nice and bright and fresh, uh, will give this wine some structure that it needs. The tannins are not particularly high, but I think there's enough tannin to give it some longevity. And also those tannins will soften up a little bit and be more supple. And as you can see, there's virtually no, there is no tertiary notes yet. And I think this wine is on the youthful side with great potential for aging where it can develop a lot more, um, you know, maybe some dried fruit characters, maybe some mushroom, a little bit of earth and leather. And I think that would make this wine even more complex and, and more interesting to drink. So definitely a wine that's interesting to drink. So go ahead and make a, make a guess. If, Christian, if you wanna go to the next slide and just to refresh everybody's memory on what the options here are. And if anybody wants to use the chat box and see what you think, we'll give you a moment to type in the letter of which you think this wine might be. Okay. And Christian, you seen any responses coming in? Not, not yet, not seeing any responses. Okay. So uh, go ahead and take your, uh, your best um, deductive guess here on which, uh, which of these wines you think Peter is trying. Um, and go ahead and put those in the, uh, in the chat box. And um, I'll have another sip while you're doing that. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. No, no one willing to take the, the jump yet. So um, okay. let's well, keep let's going. Let me just tell you, this has a real true sense of place. This wine, this one really delivers. You know, if I think, of, let me just go back to the note and just talk about pale color. There's a few grapes that have a pale color from this list. Um, Barolo made from Nebbiolo is a possibility. Chianti Classico can be. Uh, Nui St. George made from Pinot Noir can be. And that's about, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not a, it's probably one of those three varieties. So is it Pinot Noir? Is it Chianti Classico? Or Pinot Noir meaning Nui St. George. Is it Chianti Classico or is it the Barolo? Okay. Well, and if we... you read that note on the tannin, the tannin level is not high enough for Nebbiolo or Bar Barolo. And it's also not high enough for the County Classico. So the answer is, Christian, yeah. you can hit the next slide. Oh yeah, <laughs> I should wake <laughs> yeah, up. Okay. okay. All right, there it is. There it is, Nui St. George. And one, go ahead one more time and it'll show you what the wine is. So this wine is the Nui St. George from Louis Jadot. Uh, beautiful wine, great balance. It's a 2017 vintage, which was a fabulous vintage in Burgundy. Yeah, if you have a chance to go purchase some, of course, they're not cheap, but they're worth the money. This this particular vintage really delivered some beautifully balanced wines. And again, I think this wine will have some longevity given its youthful uh, nature. Okay, so let's try wine number two. We'll go ahead and give you the tasting note here. And let me pull this up. So um, when I first looked at this wine, I said pale, but I'm actually, now I'm sort of between pale and medium. If I look again, maybe I poured a little bit more wine my second time around, so the color seems a little bit more intense. But it either pale or medium ruby. Uh, the intensity is more pronounced than what was in the previous wine, so I'm going medium plus. And again, there are some red fruit characters here. I get a lot of uh, some red currant, some red cherry, red plum, uh, strawberry. I didn't I didn't circle raspberry because it's I don't think think it's that ripe. And overall, the fruit is sort of just ripe. There's some black fruit, like black currant, uh, some blueberry, black cherry, and black plum. Um, a little bit of a dried, dried herb character, and maybe a little uh, black pepper. I classify this fruit as just ripe. And there's a little something else. It's je ne sais quoi. <laughs> it's the it's a little bit of volatile acidity. Not particularly um, bad in a sense that it doesn't. It's not a flaw I mean, by volatile acidity. You know, that could mean like vinegar or it can mean something like sort of that nail polish remover. But I don't really, it's almost like there's something underneath that's giving a little bit of lift to this wine. So on the palate, it's dry. Wow, the acid is really good, really mouthwatering already. So medium plus or maybe even high. And the tannins are fairly substantial. I, I would classify that as medium plus. And they're a little dusty. 
Um, and the reason I just want to point out, the reason I wrote in Dusty is that if you are taking the diploma exam, you are free to write in other descriptors that aren't necessarily on the WSET lexicon. But just make sure you, that whatever you use, whatever language you use or descriptors, that it's something that is commonly understood because you can communicate your note in any way that you like, but it just needs to be understood by uh, the person who's gonna be marking your exam. In other words, don't use some, you know, if you have some oddball fruit that nobody else has ever heard from, don't or heard about, don't use that, but you can use you know, other descriptors. And I use Dusty because I think Dusty's not quite chalky. It's not as high as chalky, but it's a little bit more grainy than what I would describe as fine grain. So it's sort of in between fine grain and um, core and chalky. And I have to thank Janet Campen on her team for, for using that the other day. And it kind of stuck in my mind, which is why I used it again today. And then uh, the alcohol's medium, uh, a little more body here, like medium plus. I think the uh, intensity again is pronounced or not quite uh, medium plus on the intensity. And then the finish is pretty good. I mean, the finish is medium plus. Um, the more I taste it again, it seems a little longer than I first tried it this morning when I was between medium and medium plus. So overall, the quality, I rated this as very good because it does have great balance. Uh, medium plus intensity gets it a check mark on the intensity scale and also has great complexity. Uh, I forgot to mention that there's a little bit of slight oaky character, like a little bit of toast or cedar, maybe even a hint of vanilla. And there's a beginning of some tertiary notes, some leather, some earth, and a little bit of forest floor. I think that these tertiary notes are still on the just beginning to develop. So given the good levels of acid and tannin, this wine has a structure to age. The tannins will certainly soften with, uh, let's say, five to six or more years in the bottle. And there's plenty of opportunity for more tertiary notes to develop, which I think will give this wine a lot more uh, interest in the years to come. So let's put up the options again. And you can see, obviously, it's not the Nui St. George. So which one of those other 11 wines do you think this is? OK, we'll play a little Jeopardy music while. Let's play a little Jeopardy music. And if you can let me know what everyone's guessing. Yep. So we did have some uh, some good participation the last time around. Uh, people guessing and uh, putting in their answers there. So we'll give give you a little bit of time to pop I'll those have in. Another sip. You know, one clue again, which I think I sort of passed over quickly, but I did classify this as just ripe, and there's really good acidity. So the climate's kind of moderate. It's certainly not a really warm or hot climate by any means. Great. That might give you a little bit of a clue. Yeah, so we have some votes coming in. Um, a okay. couple of votes for, for Barolo so far. Um, mm -hmm. A vote for saint um, uh as well. Um, so yeah, those are those are the early early votes. Okay. All right. Well, let's Chianti go Chianti Classico is another one. Uh, right, now they're well, rolling in. That. Barolo, Yay. yeah. So there's good job. It is Chianti Classico. Yay! All right. Well done. Uh, yeah. So, so Berglund and 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 uh, Michelle both got um, Chianti Classico. Well, cheers to that. <laughs> good job. So yeah, go ahead. Just click the next two slides, and that'll show you it's Chianti, and I'll show you which wine it is. This is the Cursabella 2016 Chianti Classico. This is an amazing example of what Chianti should be. Uh, this is, by the way, 100% Sangiovese. You can add other grape varieties in Chianti Classico up to 20% uh, of other grapes, but no other grape can be more than 10% of the blend. Uh, and in this case, this is 100% Sangiovese. This wine did spend a little bit of time in French oak, but only 5% of the oak was new. So as I mentioned, the, the oak is just hinting in the background, and it's really expressing the nature of the grape, um, which is that red fruit character, a little bit of um, some black fruit, but more of a red fruit character. It's got some of that spice and, and developed a little bit of dried herbs. And then again, high, fairly high or medium plus tannins, and then medium plus acidity. If, if this wine had high tannins, I could see it being a Barolo because usually Barolo is almost always high. Um, it's really uh, a, typically a higher, uh, uh, tannin with Barolo or Nebbiolo than you'd find with Sangiovese. Okay, so we have one more wine to taste and uh, go ahead and let's show you that particular note. 
So this wine, as you can see, has the deeper color. So I, this wine is much deeper, um, has a deep ruby color with just the I underlined garnet only because it's just starting to get a little bit of a garnet color, but it's still primarily ruby. The intensity is medium plus and more dark fruit in this wine than we found in the previous two wines. There is a little bit of violet as well. Um, some red cherry, some red plum, but more dominated by black currant, blackberry, black cherry. There's also some herbs, a little bit of dill, which is kind of interesting, um, and some pepper and also some black licorice. I call this food is ripe. It really seems well developed and, and well ripened. And there's a little bit of a of black currant leaf. So just a little bit of an herbal edge to it as well. I found a little bit of influence from some oak influence that shows in the vanilla, cedar, and maybe a little bit of chocolate. And then on the nose, there's also a beginning of some tertiary notes, a little bit more than the previous one. So I get some leather, a little bit of meat, mushroom, and some dried fruit, maybe a little dried cherry, a little bit of uh, perhaps dried plum. It smells great. Now tasting this wine, wow. This has dry, medium, medium plus tannins, uh, medium, medium plus acid as well. And the tannins are very fine grain. They're integrated so beautifully. There's nothing that tastes coarse or bitter. Alcohol is a little bit warmer here. And when I breathe in, even after I uh, taste the wine, I can get a little bit of a warming, burning sensation in the back of my throat. And mod, uh, body's medium plus. The intensity follows on the palate like it did on the nose to be medium plus. And again, the finish is also quite lengthy. Not quite long, but I would call that medium plus. Again, if we look at our overall quality, we have a wine that's got wonderful balance between that uh, medium or medium plus acidity, but it is fresh. Uh, the tannins support the ripe fruit and give it the structure that it needs to age. There's a, enough intensity of the fruit as well that this wine not only has the structure, the acid and tann tannin that it can age, but it also has that wonderful complexity as you see from our tasting note. I, I think this wine is just beginning to begin that sort of uh, mature stage of bottle aging. It's really showing, showing some really good tertiary notes but I think it has a long, long way to go. So I do think this wine is suitable for aging. And when we are talking about ageability with the wines for the diploma, um, we're generally using a five-year rule for red wines, meaning if the wine will improve and be more enjoyable after five years, then it is suitable for aging. If it's a white wine, we generally use a three-year rule. But the key is that the wine must improve. Just holding its own or just staying the way it is doesn't give it a mark in the suitability for aging. So if you think the wine just going to hold its own and not get better, then you would write down not suitable for aging. So let's go ahead and show those options one more time. So again, we can see here some darker colored grapes, which tend to be sort of medium or medium plus on the tannin and also medium, medium plus on the acid. What do you think those might be? And we'll play you a little Jeopardy also, music here. Yeah, go ahead. As you're thinking, thinking through. There's a really good earthiness of this wine too, which kind of puts me more, I'll tell you right now, more in the old world. Um, while the fruit is ripe, it's not jammy by any means. And there is a clue in my note, which some of you may pick up on, which I'll tell you what it is once we get to the uh, reveal stage. Okay, so we have some early votes in for um, uh, one for Shiraz Barossa, another one for mm -hmm. uh, Rioja Reserva, um, someone else saying um, uh, Malbec uh, from, uh, from Mendoza, uh, mm -hmm. two votes for that so far, and then uh, saint Emilion is another, uh, another vote, Carmenere, uh, someone put, and uh, someone else put Vacaras. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're a okay. little bit all over. Uh, all well, over. one of those is right. <laughs> so one of those is right. And maybe I'll do a little deductive. Um, so Carmenere typically is, a, when it's ripe, it doesn't show a lot of 
herbaceous note, but it still shows like a little bit of a pencil lead, a little bit of graphite. And even, even when it's ripe, it does have a little bit of a herbaceous, slight green tone to it. I, I wouldn't call it green pepper, but more like a red pepper. Um, so I don't pick that up in this wine. Uh, Malbec, that's also a possibility. I think the fruit might be a little bit riper and maybe not, as I said, I get a little earthiness in this wine. Usually with Malbec, they tend to be very fruit driven and really juicy, like blackberry, black cherry. Uh, it's almost like biting into a fresh bowl of, of red berries when you taste a Malbec. This wine's got some earthiness and some other things, which maybe doesn't quite fit that profile. Uh, somebody said uh, Barossa Shiraz. Mm -hmm. That could be this wine because there is some oak and they often use, traditionally they use American oak, which has got some of that vanilla, but more often nowadays are using French and or um, American. But it tends to be a lot of ripe, almost jammy fruit. And I think this wine doesn't quite have that character. Santamelion's a good one too. I think uh, being a Merlot grape is a dominant variety there showing this type of acid and tannin profile could definitely be that. Um, but generally there's also, um, maybe if it's a quality that most Santamelians are, they tend to use a lot more oak. And I didn't pick up, I didn't mention the level of the oak, but it, the, the oak is not particularly high. Um, it's, it's there, but it's not dominating or it's, it's certainly in the background. And Vacaras would normally be, uh, Again, other, all these are great guests, but Vacaras is generally based on Grenache, although it can blend other grapes in. But if it is sort of a Grenache dominant Vacaras, it might have a little lower acid and a little bit lower tannin. So I only left one out, which is, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay. And that is the Rioja Reserva. So whoever got that, cheers. Yeah. Great job for My Miles. Doing that. Miles was the first one to yeah. uh, to put that in, so congratulations, Miles, on on nailing that one. Yeah, and I think one of the keys that I didn't really talk about, but there's a dill note, and this dill note is from what I typically get with American oak, um, vanilla, dill, sometimes sort of like a wood shaving or carpenter shop. If you walk in, you get all that sort of sawdusty smell. There's a little bit of that in here too, but um, this does use all American oak. And if you want to show the next slide, we can show them what the wines are. So this is the uh, Marquez de Murrieta 2015 Rioja Reserva. And this wine is really just at its beginning of showing some nice development and tertiary notes, which, I, you know, these wines really uh, belie their, their, um, their age. I mean, if I looked at that wine, I wouldn't necessarily think it's five years old. I would guess maybe three, possibly four, but it shows the, the Tempranillo grape shows this unbelievable um, unique ability to age really well, even though it's not a grape that's particularly high in acid or tannin. Uh, so it has this ability to hold up and not oxidize uh, very readily. So this is a, a wine I think I, I would love to taste, taste this in another five to 10 years. Hmm. So um, any questions from the audience? I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, right. Any Techniques or anything? This is your opportunity to pick uh, one of the best tasters in the world's uh, minds here, uh, Peter Marks, Master of Wine. Uh, so if you have any questions, put those in the in the comment uh, section. Peter, these are all delicious wines. I'm quite envious that I don't have glasses in I was front of me. Say, <laughs> Christian, come on over. I mean, if you're not busy this afternoon. It's a, so, it's a, I'm looking outside. It's like it's a beautiful day. It's almost like you want to. If it was spring, it would be like taking a, a spring break and going and heading to the beach or something. Yeah, it is. It is uh, absolutely gorgeous. And a, a gorgeous California day. Um, let's right. see. So just a lot of uh, thanks for um, for your time today. Um, someone saying this is so much fun. Uh, thanks so much. So um, really super informative. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. I do want to call out that we are doing just a quick uh, couple of notes uh, real quick. And one is that we are doing a champagne trivia um, on Monday uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, here on Facebook. Uh, so make sure and join us uh, for that uh, in honor of Champagne Day, which is coming up uh, later in October. Uh, but you'll be able to do uh, test your champagne knowledge uh, for that champagne trivia. And then, of course, we will have uh, more of these awesome tasting opportunities with, with Peter and the rest of the team uh, on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Uh, on Facebook. So 
thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Peter, thank you uh, so much. Well, thank you all for joining. Enjoy Cheers. that wine, and, and we'll, see, uh, we'll see all of you here on Monday. Cheers. Cheers.